Hi guys, so this is the lecture, mini lecture on 13.2 on specific immunity. The learning outcomes are on this first slide and I'm going to get right into stage one, which is the development of lymphocyte diversity. So we're going to start out with events in the T-cell maturation. Remember this ha happens in the thymus. And what we need to keep in mind is that there are co-receptors that are on the T-cells. All T cells will have CD3 receptors and these um, assist in binding. We also have CD4 receptors on our T helper cells. These are the receptor proteins that will bind to MHC2 molecules, so the ones that will recognize antigens being presented. And then the CD8 receptors are only found on cytotoxic T cells, and these bind to the MHC1 molecule. And I have a good diagram of this here. So you'd see this antigen binding site that would be looking for the antigen that's presented, and the CD4 will actually help in that binding to an antigen presenting molecule. When we look at the diversity and the lymphocyte diversity within the B cell maturation. Remember this happen, happens in bone marrow sites and these lymphocytes will be circulating then in the blood after they've matured and they will be mainly going to the lymph nodes and other lymphatic system uh, organs looking for any kind of antigen. And this is what the surface of a B cell would look like we have the antigen binding re region. This is a really important part. This is the part that's going to be specific for a particular antigen. And then we also have MHC2 markers so they can actually present too. This table is giving uh, the differences between B cells and T cells, looking at the site of maturation, what specific surface markers are there, uh, in the case of B cells, it's immunoglobulin, which are those antibody-like looking molecules. On the T cells, we have T cell receptors, and which are several of the CD molecules. Remember CD4 on the T helper cells and CD8 on the cytotoxic cells. Um, circulation in the blood, receptors for the antigen. Distribution in lymphatic organs I'm not as not as interested in. And then remember which one requires an antigen presented with MHC? This is the T cells that require it. And then what happens when they are stimulated by an antigen? In the case of B cells, remember that they then will proliferate into plasma cells and memory cells, whereas the T cells will go into several types of activated T cell and memory cells. Remember, it can be the regulatory T cells, helper T cells, or cytotoxic T cells here. And then the general functions. For B cells, we always want to think about antibodies, so the production of antibodies that can target and inactivate or neutralize antigens. And for T cells, this is where we get cells that are activated that take part in the immune system and can either suppress or kill the abnormal cells mediate any hypersensitivity, so maybe calm down if it looks like it's an allergic type reaction, and then synthesize cytokines to communicate between the different parts of the immune system. So how do we go about getting these this diversity that these cells can recognize any particular antigen that comes in? So when the B and T cells are maturing and by the time they reach the lymphoid tissue, each cell has the ability to respond to a single unique antigen, meaning that each of the B and T cells that are mature are specific for a unique antigen that they do not share with other B and T cells. And this is generated because of some rearrangement of gene segments on the antigen receptors. So both T and B cells have those antigen receptors. And what happens is there are huge amounts of the gene segment of that portion that can be rearranged so that they could code for every possible recombination, or sorry, every possible antigen. So in that case, recombination occurs and we have a huge assortment of lymphocytes. And crazy as it may sound, but we estimate that each human produces antibodies with 10 trillion different specificities. So you can imagine with that many different specificities, any bacteria or virus that it might come into contact with, there should be one antibody that would be able to recognize it. So with B cells, 
what we see for what binds with antigen and is specific is the portion called the immunoglobulin, often shortened to capital I, little g. And these are glycoprotein molecules that are the receptors on B cells. And then they can also be secreted as antibodies. Just that portion, that glycoprotein molecule, can be secreted as an antibody. So the interesting part about the immunoglobulin structure is that it looks a little bit like a Y. And it's the pockets at the ends of that Y, or the fork of it, that are very variable and can change shape to fit any kind of antigen, or have a change shape to fit any kind of antigen. Within those antigen binding regions, there's a portion called the variable regions. And this is where we see that huge difference from one clone to another, meaning that we could have specificity for any antigen presented. This is a nice picture of what that looks like. So they're showing here that there are sections of DNA that encode for the variable region. And that depending on the transcripts from the same gene, that it may start here, it may start down here, that this portion of that immunoglobulin molecule is variable. It is changeable and there are very different ones for each one that we see. So we have a constant region that attaches to the B cell and then we have that variable region which is where the antigen binds and because each one of these is different for a given B cell, so each B cell has a different immunoglobulin, there should be a specific one for every antigen out there. And it's this entire Y-shaped molecule that is considered the immunoglobulin. So that's uh, the B cells, what they look like and what happens, um, how they get differences among them and then are specific for a particular antibody. With T cells, we have something that's similar to B cells. They are also formed by those genetic recombinations so that we have that variable region that allows the population of T cells to have unique uh, receptors for any given immuno or antigen. They're inserted into the membrane and they have that antigen binding site sticking out. They are small and in opposition to B cells, these are never secreted. They are always kept on the T cells so they're not like an antibody that then is released. So how then if we get an infection and they're recognized by a particular antigen, do we get many cells then that will recognize that antigen? So what ends up happening is we have something called clonal selection. So when a correct or B or when a correct B or T cell recognizes an antigen and is activated, that lymphocyte specificity is part of what that particular lymphocyte is already pre-programmed to. And so what ends up happening is that when it begins to multiply, that genetic distinction, that, that particular uh, binding site or receptor will then be part of that clonal expansion. So we get a huge multiplication of the B or T cell clones that will match up to the original antigen that activated them. So this is a diagram showing that. We have our lymphocytes that are stem cells and we have many different kinds of them. So let's just say that this is a T cells that have all these different unique receptors on them. Now there might be one that actually recognizes self. Those ones will be eliminated so that they don't attack self. self. But we have all of these unique receptors. So this ends up being our whole repertoire. We have all of these that are kind of circulating around. And as you can see, there's one cell that has each, one cell with one receptor that is unique. So what ends up happening is that when a particular epitope, so antigen, comes and it happens to be specific for this one receptor, this is the receptor then, this is the T cell that's going to go ahead and proliferate, and all of its clones will have that exact same uh, receptor site, so that in an infection it will recognize those. And this is true for the B cells too. In that case, these receptors would be those immunoglobulin. So hopefully that makes sense. At the end of this, we have a checking in with some questions that you should be able to explain. And that was the end of lecture 13.2. If you have any questions, let me know.